Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Farah Pass from Home. It's time for Friday's Live. It's a nice relaxed session where we wind down gently into the weekend. We talk about all things family history, all things history and new records, new newspapers, new features on Farmer Pass. And it's a chance for us all to connect with each other and have a chat. And it's just generally very relaxed. Uh, come and join in the fun if you're new. Please say hi in the comments. Let me know how your week's been, what you've been working on, anything that you'd like to share, any cool discoveries, anything like that at all. I want to hear it all today, okay? My name is Ellie. I'm Senior Community Executive at Farmer Past, and we've got Jessie with us in the comments today, so be sure to say hi to her as well. I've just noticed some odd comments coming up. I'm just going to give them a little block. There we go, and hopefully they won't bother us in the comments again. <laughs> um, we are actually broadcasting on Twitter as well for the first time today. Um, so if you're watching from Twitter, please do say hello. I want to see who's joining us from over there, and uh, it's a bit of a test. So we'll see how we get on with that today. Lots of you joining, which is great. Um, I can see lots of familiar faces, familiar names in the comments. Um, Ellen has green tea with honey, snowy day, and fire past Fridays. Ellen, that sounds blissful. I'm not going to lie. Um, I've got sort of like tepid water here. Um, I was thinking to myself earlier today that I really fancied a nice coffee, but... Um, I'm not sure it's quite the weather for it. Every time I think, oh, I really fancy one, I'm too cold to have one. I just think that would make me colder. Jessie thinks I'm an idiot and I should just have one. Um, anyway, <laughs> lots of you here. This is lovely. Yes, Sally, I yes, you're here for the first time in ages. And so am I. Um, I did do a live with the National Archives. Yes, lovely, lovely Jessie on Tuesday. But other than that, this is the first one for me of 2023. So I might be a little bit rusty. <laughs> Please just bear with me. Lovely. So many of you here. It's great. Who else have we got? We've got Peter joining us from Sandhurst. Hello. We've got Donna. How are you doing? Oh, so many of you. This is great. Uh, David joining from my native North Wales. I hope North Wales, hope you're looking after it for me. Um, yes, I do. I do. I do miss it a little bit. Um, who have we got here as well? We've got Sue joining us from a cool, partly sunny Guildford. I love Guildford very much. Hello, Diane. It's your first time tuning in. Lovely to have you. Please stick around, introduce yourself. Uh, we don't bite, I promise. Um, we just sort of do a little bit of gentle banter. That's probably about as much as it gets. Um, this is great. This is, the whole gang's here. I'm really happy. This is lovely. And we've got some more spammy comments. Let's get rid of those. Let's block them. Yay. There we go. Spammy comments blocked. Fantastic. Yes, Daphne, I totally agree. Wasn't Jessie a fantastic guest? She and I were talking for a little bit afterwards and we were brainstorming ideas of how we can bring her back as well. So that won't be the last time you see Jessie on a Final Pass from Home, which is fantastic. Hello, Eileen, good to see you. Oh, this is great. I honestly feel like the whole family's here. This is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Linda saying, nice and clear on Twitter, uh, but dummy couldn't ask, work out how to enter a comment. It's a, <laughs> you're not a dummy, Linda. Um, we are very much testing it over there. I just want to see what it what it looks like, um, how it is for you guys to interact. Um, if it doesn't work, we won't do it to Twitter again, but we'll find out. Um, yeah, basically. Um, another newbie. This is wonderful. We've got Yvonne with us. Welcome, Yvonne. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I should, this is about the sort of time where I should probably tell you what we're going to be actually talking about for the next 50 minutes, 55 minutes or so. As I said, it's a super relaxed look at the new Final Pass records that we've added this week. We add new records and new newspaper pages every single week. So there's always going to be something new for you guys to come and check back. Uh, there's always going to be a new chance for you to find a new story or a new ancestor or make that little bit of extra progress on your family tree. We also do a little bit of history on here as well. We do a question of the week, which I will announce in a second. Uh, we do the mini tutorials. So if you are not very familiar with Find My Past or you are just keen to learn more and how it can work the very best for you in your research, 
we do sorts of little bite-sized tutorials. So today I'm going to do one on free records because yes, we actually do have some completely free records on Find My Past. And the only thing you need to access these is a free account on Find My Past. That is it. You don't need a subscription and you don't need a free trial. So we'll have a look at those. And in terms of the other thing I'm gonna do today, um, towards the end of the session, because it's Holocaust Memorial Day, I am going to be talking about a story that I have recently researched. And no, it's not particularly, it's not, it's not particularly uplifting. Um, it's not very jolly. It's important nonetheless on today of all days on Holocaust Memorial Day. I very much hope you will stick around for that. I think it's important, but I, I understand if it's too much for you, especially because it's January, right? And I was saying to Jesse earlier today, I finally feel like the January fog. I don't know if I'm explaining this right. Maybe some of you will understand. But you know, this sort of fog that you have in January where it just all feels a bit, a little, everything just feels a bit blurry. And I finally feel that that's lifting a little bit. So I'm really pleased. And do you know what? Let's just let's should we, should we just should we, should we, should we just dive, delve in. And um, I'm just going to give you the question of the week quickly, so you guys can have a think about your answers to this. So, question of the week this week: Which ancestor are you most proud of, and why? So, I want to hear the inspirational. I want to hear the people about the people that you you tell at, you you speak about at dinner parties and things like that. Okay, that's what I want to hear today. Which ancestor are you most proud of and why? Grand. Now, do I have any more housekeeping for you? Let's have, let's just check my little notes, see if I've got any more housekeeping. No, I don't. Okay, right. Should we get into the new records? Yay. Okay, right. Let me share my screen. Here we go. This is one I prepared earlier. OK, so let's delve in, shall we? So new this week, a little bit of a military flavour for you. And two of the new uh, collections, they are absolutely brand new to Find My Past. They are for the Honourable Artillery Company. Now, this is the oldest regiment in the British Army, not continuously serving. It was established by none other than Henry VIII himself in 1537 by Royal Charter. That's a long time ago. Like that's a really long time ago. And it can the, the uh, regiments can actually trace its history further back still to 1087 and William the Conqueror. Now, unusually, the regiment fought on both sides of the English Civil War as well. And there are two, two record collections we've added for this one regiment this week. So the first up, we've got the, I'm going to butcher pronunciation, I always do, Cardu Rendell Roll of Members, 1537 to 1908. Now, these are little biographies which cover around 17,000 members of this regiment over the course of nearly 400 years. The detail that you'll find will absolutely vary based on the person, for example, and this is actually one of the oldest ones. So this is from 1537 and it's the record for Anthony Nivert. Um, he was a, court a courtier and he was a gentleman usher for Henry VIII and even had his own character in the Tudors, I think. Although I think they, I think they killed him off at the wrong, completely the wrong time. He was later a lieutenant of the Tower of London and he refused to torture and ask you, uh, if you know anything about Tudor history. Uh, absolutely fascinating period of history. I absolutely recommend you to go and look it up. So yeah, and it actually tells you on these um, right at the bottom, I think I've cut this off, but for the older ones, it tells you where this particular source has got its information from. So I think some of them were saying that they would got it from uh, an Ashmole um, manuscript and something from the British Library. I cannot remember the specifics, but it will tell you if it's got the where it's got the information from, which is really, really handy. OK, next up, the next new collection is for the same regiment. It's the Honourable Artillery Company Journal for 1923 to 2021. It's really easy to flip through so you can bring up the image viewer at the bottom. 
and it's got lots of pictures in it, like re like this one, for example, um, definitely worth exploring, even if you don't have a, like an ancestral connection to this to this regiment, even if you just have an interest in, interest in um, British military regiments anyway, or First World War, Second World War, etc. Because it does, um, even though it only starts in 1923, it does look back to the Great War, to the First World War, and then various commentaries on the regiment's involvement in the Second World War as well. Um, yeah, it's it's really, really interesting. And there's little, like, there's a little memorial here that I found, and I thought this was really sweet. Um, this is a little memorial for Major James Thatcher Catley. Excellent name. Great, lo lovely picture of him. And just at the bottom, it's uh, there's a little... Um, dedication from his father and it reads my son was wedded heart and soul to the regiment I do not think he ever missed a single drill during all these years he was a member unless he was out of town every other engagement had to give place to this one absorbing absorbing duty and I just <laughs> I think I thought that was lovely really lovely little tribute to his son Last up, we've got some more records into our Coldstream Guards records, and they we've added around 48,000 new ones to this collection. The records cover things like attestation books, transfers, um, casualties, deaths, discharges, honours, awards. There's a lot of stuff in there, and it will vary from book to book. Um, this one in particular, I definitely rolled over to the next slide by mistake. Spoiler alert. This is the enlistment role for a chap called Peter William Aiton um, in 1919. He was born in Norfolk, according to this record, which means he may well be a distant relation of my hubby because his Aiton line were from London and then from Norfolk. Um, however, when I went and tried to find out more information about this guy, um, I actually really struggled. The only other mention I could find of him was him dying in Norwich in 1982. I don't know about that one. I, I didn't really have time to go in and dig into it a little bit deeper. But if anybody would like to, um, have at it, basically. OK. Um, OK, well, we need to move on to newspapers now. This is what we've got up this week. And I have to I absolutely have to mention this. OK, so a couple of weeks ago, Jesse and I got to visit our scanning studio at the British Library at Boston Spa. And... If you've ever wondered, if you've ever come to these every week and you've looked at the list of newspapers that we've added or the list of newspapers that we've updated, you've seen that we've added 600, 700,000 uh, newspaper pages that week. And you've ever wondered how that actually takes place. I knew how it happened, but I didn't fully appreciate how it happened if you follow my drift. It was really eye-opening for me. Uh, the team there are so knowledgeable and so passionate and they work so hard they are scanning these huge um huge big books of old newspapers from paper and they put them on these huge scanners and they have to turn every single individual page and scan it one at a time it is a ridiculously manual process. I hadn't quite understood that before I saw it happen. Karen saying we need a video. Funny you should say that. Um, we might have some um, video content coming soon. That might have been one of the reasons Jesse and I went there in the first place. So just watch this space. Um, but yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And, you know, I'm standing there watching and filming while... Um, they are standing in front of these huge scanners. They've got these huge books on the scanner and they have to put um, like black paper around each one and they have to they have to turn, they have to put the, the scanner down, they have to wait for it to scan and then almost immediately it comes up onto their computer and they have to check whether it's all aligned, etc., that it's not, uh, it's not blurry, that it's nice and clear. And then they just have to repeat that process over and over again. It's amazing. They're amazing. And they're probably not listening today because they're, you know, working hard. But if you are listening, Boston Spa team, I have a newfound appreciation for the work that you do. So there we go. But it's not just paper either. It's also they scan from microfilm, too. So they've got um, they've got some microfilm scanning machines and 
they're, they're loading them in and they're scanning them through and then they're appearing on the screen. It's just technology is amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I asked them, they, they've numbered their machines. And I said, have you ever named them? And they were like, no. I said, right, well, we're going to call that one that scans microfilm Mike. I don't think they got my sense of humor. But hey, -ho, um, that one microfilm scanning machine, I think it was machine number six or something, that will forever be known as Mike. But yes, this is what we've got you this week. So this is what they, they've been working on. Um, new titles from Canuck, Blackpool, Middlesex, Lancaster. And then we've got updated titles too. The full list is available on the blog um, from Brighton, Chiswick, Clanesley, Rochdale and beyond. So when you're looking at the new newspaper titles for this week, hopefully you will do what I did and think, goodness me, this is all thanks to the work from the Boston Spa team and then also the Dundee team who take those images and then get them on the website for you. It's just fantastic. Anyway, it's going to end up being a huge Boston Spa team love in in a moment. So I'm just going to stop. Hmm. OK, so that's all the new records for this week. Uh, there we go. Uh, Jill saying, how do I find the blog? OK, so Jesse should hopefully have the link to this week's blog post. If you throw that in the comments, please, Jesse. The full list is in there and there's lots of links as well. So if you want to go and explore the new record sets, then they're all linked in there for you. Thank you, Jesse, for also composing said blog for this week. OK, should we do question of the week? Yes. Thank you, Jesse. Where is my question of the week banner? There it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. OK, right. I'm going to scroll all the way back up to the top. And we're going to do question of the week. So question of the week is, which ancestor are you most proud of and why? OK, I'm just scrolling down. OK. Darlene says, probably my paternal three times great grandfather who came from Barcelona, Spain as a tax collector for the king. Wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, my grandfather was born in 1792 in Spain uh, and died 120 years later in Trinidad, Colorado, USA. Amazing. Um, who else have we got here? Oh, I have to bring this up. Thank you, Anya. I've been getting involved in the Every Name Counts project this week and managed to transcribe almost 400 central location index records. It's all records linked to victims of the Nazis. It's utterly heartbreaking, but I wanted to do something that might help those researching their families. That's lovely. Guys, if you can check this out, uh, please check out the link that Anya's put in the chat. That's wonderful. Um, Karen says, my third times great grandmother, Anne Isabella Guy, born 1814 in the Lake District. She married and settled in London, took over running a cheesemonger's after her husband's early death, whilst raising six children. She went on to set up a publishers that printed her father's educational books when her son was old enough to run the cheesemongers. She sounds amazing. I'd have loved to have met her. And ra while raising six children after losing your husband, you, yeah, that's that's wonderful. What an amazing person. What an amazing person. Um, Gina, I guess it has to be my dad. Besides being a great dad, he was very hardworking. And as a teenager in the army medics, was one of the personnel that helped to liberate Bergen Belsen. So it also fits with Holocaust Memorial Day. Wow. Who else was I reading about that was there? when Bergen Belsen was liberated. I think it was Reverend Richard Coles. He said his father was there as well, Gina. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, Andrew says, um, I have looked through the Horwich Chronicle and found lots about Baron Furness must have been the same owners. Potentially, yeah. Um, Jeff says, my... Great grandmother, three times removed, Sarah Linsell, born in 1846 in Ireland, and she died in 1918 in Kingston, Kingston upon Thames. She was two years old when she went with her family um, to India and then New Zealand. She married twice as a minor in India 
and had um, nine or ten children and lived a full life. She sounds very well travelled indeed. Absolutely. Ellen says, this is a tough question. I like giving you tough questions because I apparently like to make you really, really think right at the end of the week. I should do easier questions. Uh, so many people to be proud of. On quick reflection, it's my paternal grandfather who immigrated from a tiny village in Tuscany. He was the epitome of hardworking immigrants in the early 20th century, climbing down a ladder each day to work as a labourer at a brick factory in the valley at the end of the street. His English was not the best, and I have a memory of him in his 70s hauling shingles up the roof to help my dad finish building our house. Oh, in his 70s. That's lovely. Good on him. I like him a lot. That That's made me, yeah, that's made me a bit misty-eyed. Um, Georgia says, my, oh, can I show the comment, please? Come on. There we go. My great uncle, George Blythe, who was sent to Canada all on his own by Bernardo's aged 11. He worked on a farm until age 22, returned to England in 1915 to join his brother in the Essex Regiment. He was killed in 1917 at Gaza. I want happy stories. I'm joking. Um, this, that's, oh, you know, that's so, so sad, Georgia. Um, but like you, I am proud of him. What a man. What a chap. Um, it is so hard to choose. Um, you don't have to choose just one. You could put several ones in the chat if you want. Um, I am not going to judge. In fact, the more the merrier. OK, Andrew says, it has to be my mum's mum. Widowed at 35, she brought up two children alone. She worked nights at the ROF. Not sure what that is. Um, I met up in a cafe for breakfast, then off to bed for her and school for the children. I love this. Um, OK, what have we got here? Donna says, um, my ancestor, Richard Kenner, um, I'm most proud of from Oxfordshire in the UK. In Was he born 1635, was he? Um, uh, writing a book on the Kenner family ancestors in the hopes to raise money for the restoration and maintenance of the cemetery. Oh, that's lovely. That's really good of you. I want to build the story around this. Need free records available for colonists who have established America. Best of luck with that. Um, I think that's a fantastic project to raise money for the for the cemetery. Um, Sue says you've heard about him before. Uh, I like hearing about them again, though. Um, my three times great grandfather, Charles Thompson, was a minister for the Church of Scotland, was sent to Wick in 1843, had to leave the Church of Scotland and join the Free Church. And in his lifetime, built two churches. One is still standing, but was closed as a church in 2007 and is now a shop. Amazing. So enterprising. So many of these ancestors of ours. Mine weren't as enterprising, but I'm still I'm so proud of them. Yvonne says, my granny's is such a long story. I'd have to have a sleepover. Do you know what? That is a grand idea. We should have a find my past sleepover. When we just share stories like this. Or we could just have a coffee morning. Or maybe a virtual coffee morning. That might be fun. But then we've got, maybe with the time zones it wouldn't work. I'll, I'll think about it. Um, okay, Anya says, uh, just because I blocked a pilot her the other week, my first cousin four times removed, Dr. Mary Lee Edward. I've just been looking at her education this week. She was the first woman to graduate from the University of Toronto in medicine, ended up moving to New York and was awarded a scholarship to study in Vienna to learn to become a surgeon. She ended up working on the Western Front in 1917 to 1918 and became a lieutenant in the French Army. She worked 60 hours only stopping when she had to eat. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 pretty good. Um what a woman. I have very little to say to these other than that's just amazing. Uh because a lot of these stories sometimes just made me a little bit speechless. <laughs> They're that good. Um excuse me a moment, Sally. <clears throat> this is what happens when I talk too much. I am proud of my great great aunt. She helped to bring me up with my mum. She was born in 1888, and although she was a single lady, she had so many life experiences. I remember her tales of growing up in Oxford, in Brighton, and life in service in Devon. She died aged 100. Oh, I love that she helped bring you up. That's lovely. 
Oh, there's so many good stories today. Janet says, if I had to choose, I don't, I'm not making you choose. You can if you want, and you can put several, so you don't actually have to just choose one. Um, my <laughs> maternal grandmother brought up nine children, seven boys and two girls, and a nephew. A tough lady who took no nonsense, especially from her sons. The family business, French polisher, cabinet makers, was run from the same premises. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I love that she brought up her nephew as well. I've seen, I've been doing a little bit of research for something work related. That I can't really talk about too much yet. But um, what I've seen, I've been looking at the 1921 census specifically, and it's amazing how many different strands of one family are living in the same house post first world war you know you've got cousins and nephews and nieces and grandparents all living in the same household and they're all looking after each other and living together uh, maybe because they had to but also maybe because that's what they chose to do and yeah it's just great uh, you are absolutely right Karen we would not sleep we would just carry on talking the entire night uh, yeah, basically. Um, Arlene, um, I would say my maternal great grandmother, Eliza, born in 1860 and married in 19. She had 15 children from her two marriages, not all of whom lived to adulthood. She was widowed quite young and remarried soon after to my great granddad. On family records, I've noticed the half siblings sharing homes and as witnesses to each other's weddings. So I think she must have done a great job in phrasing a loving family. Um, she saw several of her boys wounded in the First World War and nearly lost my, I can't see the rest of it because my streaming tool has cut it off, I'm afraid. But that's absolutely lovely. Grand. Thank you so much for sharing those, everybody. Those are really wonderful stories. Yeah, just really lovely, actually. Um, yeah, really nice. Who wants to have a look at some free records? Shall we do that? Let's do that. Right. I just need to share my screen. Uh, bear with me two seconds while I grab that. There you go. Grand. OK. So this might be useful for you if you don't have a Farm Pass subscription you, or you've not done a free trial yet or you've already done your free trial or maybe you're not in the position to take out a subscription at the moment. Um, or maybe you look at this and you think that would be really useful for my friend, my family member, etc. Bear all this in mind, because actually, I think some of these will surprise you. So we have some free records on Pharma Past. They're completely free to view. You don't need a subscription. You don't need a free trial to access them. All you need is a free Pharma Past account. That is it. OK, so. To find these, you want to log in. You want to go all the way down to the bottom where you've got this sort of sort of navy, what do you call it? It's like a footnote to the page. There's loads of handy links here, but the one we're going to want is free genealogy records on farmerpass.co.uk. Okay? And this is the page. So what we want to do is, um, we're, ju we're just going to go through, through all of these, basically. And I may or may not have a very handy tip for you right at the end. So stay tuned. Did you know <laughs> over two million of our newspaper pages are totally free to view? That's around 400 titles. So our newspapers are brought online in partnership with the British Library. And the free pages include a wide range of regional titles such as Manchester Times and Gazettes ladies own paper for example um, there's also titles that are more focused on um, actors activism politics and things like that such as the british emancipator and then you've got specialist titles such as the jewish record the list is really long um, the list is all here see the newspapers and years covered so if you click into that it's a long list and these are all really free really free to view totally free I'm pretty sure you're getting the message. Um, I can't even scroll all the way down to the bottom. So I'm just going to collapse that again. There we go. So if you want to search these, if you want to have a gander, um, you can follow the link here that says search newspaper search. That sounded very Welsh. Search newspapers for free and it will take you to our newspaper search 
And what you'll see on the left-hand side here, it says buy access type. It's got the free to view filter on. If you click clear to get rid of that, for example, and you're just coming into the newspaper search with, without, without coming from the free records page. Um, come on, get there quicker. It's been slow. There we go. It's got the buy access type here and the two options are free to view and subscriber access. Um, so all you need to do is check that box and it will put the, the filter back on for you. Um, so basically, it's just a matter of going in and having a play. Um, you might find ancestors in here. Um, equally, they are really useful for contextual his historical research. So whether you're researching politics or sport or um yeah, a variety of things like that, like fashion, for example. They're really good for things like that. So if I just randomly typed in Her Majesty, because I've learned if I'm trying to search for anything about like Queen Victoria or Queen Elizabeth, if I type in Her Majesty, um, I get better results than if I just throw in like Queen Elizabeth or Queen Victoria. You should definitely do both though. Okay, so this is my top result. I'm just going to go and have a look at this. Come on, open. My mouse is being silly. Uh, let's make that full page. Oh, no, I want to turn these off. Turn search terms off. Make that full page. We're going to have a zoom in. Her Majesty's speech all about Her Majesty. Her Majesty's mind must indeed be greatly perplexed if we may judge of it by the royal speech which states that Her Majesty has ordered, Her Majesty has great satisfaction. Her Majesty has, however, to lament Her Majesty trusts. You can tell this is a, sat a satirist um, title. Um, you've also got here the Marchioness of Londonderry describing her husband as one of those old noblemen who are always peering about, and that although she has ever considered herself the best of women, she's often wish forced to wish herself without a peer. I'm sure uh, Victorian... Um, Britain found this very funny indeed. Uh, maybe I'm missing some of the context here. But yeah, fantastic. That's just that's just literally one of the three pages. Okay, moving on. We're just going to go back. Uh, I want to go back to my free records page. There we go. Okay, right. Next up, I'm going to scroll down because there's more free Irish records. Anybody? Free. Um, so these are free Roman Catholic parish baptisms. There's over 7 million records from Catholic parishes all across Ireland. You don't just get the transcript, but you also get the original image. Let's go and have a look. Takes you to a spe specific search page for searching these records. There's a little bit more detail here. Um, top locations. Should we try? Let's do a name for my Irish side. Uh, can't spell Bridget. Uh, 1849, I think. Okay. Um, yep, yeah, this is her record here. And this is the transcript. So I get where she's living when she was baptized. I get the baptism date. I get her father's name, which I don't think was Francie. Yeah, I think it was Francis. I think that's a transcription error. And, yeah, we can go through to the original image as well here, uh, but we can also view it on from our past. Uh, if we open that, close the film strip, and it's here, Bridget of Francis McKenna and Mary McIver. There we go. Great. Um, we're just going to go back. I'm going to find my free records again. Okay, right. Did somebody say... Census records. So the 1881 census transcripts on Find My Past are free to view. So that covers England, Wales and Scotland for the records of around 27 million people. And if you're wondering what was going on in 1881, well, Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell first formed the Oriental Telephone Company. Billy the Kid was shot and killed. The Savoy Theatre opened in London, and one for Jesse. Newcastle United Football Club was founded as the Stanley Football Club in 1881. 
We can search this really easily. So we can go search 1881 census for free. And again, we've got a dedicated search page here, a little bit about the census as well. And I don't know, who should we, should we do someone from my other side of the family? We'll go with Samuel Overthrow. I think he was born in 1839. And this is him. Um, so this is the transcript. He was a plasterer. Very exciting indeed. Uh, we've also got uh, John Cambridge, who was Emma's father, I think, off the top of my head. Lots of children. Only one daughter there. The rest of the sons, goodness me. Um, so the transcripts are free to view. If you want to view the image, um, you can do the free trial or subscribe. Um, That's just the original image if you want to have a look. There we go. And we're going to go back because I've got more to show you. I've still got more to show you. And um, I'm just going to keep repeating the word free. Um, where are we next? Uh, travel records. We're going to go with travel records next. Um, so there's loads of free travel records available on Farmer Past. So if you have globe trotting ancestors, um, these are going to be really great for you. Definitely check these out. There's loads to find here. Uh, so these cover... The Royal African Company, the our British and Irish Roots Collection, assisted emigration from Scotland, Pennsylvania immigrants, and then Queensland naturalisation. So there's a variety of things in there. And what you'll find if you follow it from that page, the, the, the search link, they're all applied to your search as filters for you here. So you can just go in and start searching. Military records. Yeah. Let's go have a look. So I'm going to mispronounce this, but these include the Du Ruvni. This is wrong. Roll of Honour from 1914 to 1918. British Army lists, Royal Navy lists, Royal Air Force lists, and also a Scotland Roll of Honour as well from the First World War period. And if you think you might have a military ancestor, these are a great way to get into searching about them because the Navy lists are really good. Just bear in mind that they are PDF. So when you search for somebody, you'll get your results, but you need to go into the PDF to find out more. Um, we've also got something called the Devon Wills Index. and This covers 1163 to 1999. And again, you can go through there and you can search here. I don't have any Devon ancestors um, on either side of my family, but I do have some good friends whose surname is Squire. And there's plenty of results for their family in there. OK, so that is all of the three records. Um, but top tip. I told you there was going to be a top tip at the end, you see. See where it says farmerpass.co.uk in the search bar. Do me a favour, change that to .com. Because we actually have four domains on farmerpass. We've got .co.uk, .com, .com.au and .ie. If you go to the .com domain of the free records page, you'll get even more free records. So we've got free U.S. and Canadian census records. It's the 1940 and 1950 U.S. census and then the Canadian censuses from 1851 to 1911. And then there's also some ones we've already discussed as well here. So you've got the Irish records, um, you've got the migration and the newspaper archives and things like that as well. Oh, though, yeah, there's more here as well. So there's um, U.S. obituary notices, there's Canadian headstones, um, things like cemeteries, and then there's some German-American births and baptisms as well. Um, but there are also some other record sets that we make completely free. I can't remember any off the top of my head now, but um, particularly to do with um, like slavery, for example, as well, we, we make a lot of the, the records we get for, for things like that completely free as well. Um, so there's lots for you guys to explore, and I hope that has been useful, basically. If 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 you find the um if you find any of the free records useful for your own research, I would love to know because we always want to make things like this useful for you. Great. Um okay, we are about 20 to the hour. I do have one more thing I want to touch on today. Before I do, I'm gonna have another gander through the comments here. Uh, Heather says, I'm excited to search the Roman Catholic record to try and find baptisms from my husband's ancestors who immigrated to Sheffield during the time of the Great Famine. Best of luck, Heather. Let me know what you find. I always like to know. OK, 
Okay. Okay, I'm having a scroll here. I think I'm mostly caught up, actually. <laughs> Jesse, not just free, really free. Yeah, no strings attached. <laughs> okay. Uh, Yvonne says, Canadian immigration were really helpful. Um, if I asked them a question, they got back to me with lots of information I didn't have. Do you know what? It's a great piece of advice, Yvonne. Um, just asking, asking people in the know. And you, I think we're sometimes surprised. We sometimes think, oh, no, why, why, would, why would somebody want to help me? Like, what's it to them? People are really nice. People are lovely. They want to help. Um, they love the past and family history and they understand the importance of tracing your family tree and finding those stories that are important to you they understand that so if you are stuck ask whether you ask in our from a past community in the final past forum if you ask in the wider genealogy and research community you ask family history societies um, libraries and archives and then places like um the Can canadian immigration as well um, charities as well just just ask people are really lovely okay great okay um so the one last thing I wanted to look at today um is a story to tie in with Holocaust Memorial Day um it's the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz uh, in 1945 today and it's a time when we stop and remember this truly awful aspect of history to ensure that it doesn't happen ever again. I appreciate it's quite a heavy topic. I think it's important to tell anyway. It's not the sort of thing I would normally talk about uh, on Friday's Live. Um, if it's too heavy for you, I totally understand. But I hope that you will continue to listen. Um, if you are sticking around, thank you very much. And um, yeah, I think we'll we'll just we'll just take it easy with this one because it is it, it's 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 not it's not very joyful. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen again and I'll show you. No, that's not the right one. Yes, Victoria, I've got my tissues ready as well. Okay, I was I had to I had to I don't normally practice Friday's lives. Okay, I normally just write up a couple of bullet points and away I go. I practice this bit. Just, just to give you a heads up, okay? So I'm just going to share one story, and there are thousands, millions I could have picked. Um, I'm, ju I'm just going to focus on this one. If you have any that you would like to share, I know one of you already said that, um, Gina, that you said that your, was it your father um, was uh, there when Bergen-Belsen was liberated? Um, I'd, I'd love to hear any stories that you have, or they don't have to be directly related to you, but maybe just ones that you know about. So this bit of research came about because I was looking, as one does, in the Final Pass photo collection. Um, I like to look through it every now and then because I think it's got some really wonderful images and I love old photos. And I came across this portrait of a particularly smartly dressed man and I wondered who he was. And on some of the photographs in the photo collection, if you bring up the image viewer at the bottom, there's a little thing that says extra materials like it would on a census. And I clicked on that and I found this image on the left hand side. So it's a bit of accompanying detail that tells me a little bit more about the photograph, because these were photographs that were used for newspapers. Um, so this was the accompanying note and it read, the only Briton in Belson gives evidence in trial. Mr. Harold Osmond Ledrulinek, I probably pronounced that wrong, I'm really sorry, Harold. A Jersey schoolmaster, the only Briton to survive the horrors of Belson camp where he was imprisoned for 10 days, described his experiences to the court at Lundberg during the trial of Joseph Kramer. Now, if you have joined Friday's Live before, you will know what I'm like. I can't resist looking at something like this. Even with such a horrific topic, my interest was piqued and I wanted to tell his story. So I had to go and find out more. And if you're interested, if you do go and look up his photograph in the photo collection, when you bring up his image and you've got the image viewer at the bottom, 
near his image, there is actually a photograph as well of, well, there are other photographs of that were taken around the Lundberg trials, the Belson trials. There's a photograph of the wife of the um, camp commandant, um, Joseph Kramer. There's a photograph of her there as well. So who was this guy then? So he was Harold. He was born in Jersey in 1911. We actually have his baptism record on Find My Past. It tells me that his father was called Vincent. We actually also have him on the 1921 census with his mother, who was, um, she was called Sainte Francoise. She was French born and she was a widow by 1921. Harold was nine years old at this point, and he had several older sisters. We've got Alice, Ivy, and I think Elsie, if I'm reading the handwriting correctly. Uh, one of them was a dressmaker, Alice was. There was also another sister, at least one other. Um, she was, I think, the eldest sister, and her name was Louisa. By 1921, she was married um, to a chap named Gould, and they had a son as well. And Later on, between 1921 and the Second World War, Harold became a teacher. He got married and he they had a son as well. Now, I don't know about any of you, but when I was learning about the Second World War in school, I never knew that the Channel Islands were occupied by the Nazis. I had no idea that, in effect, they were pretty much abandoned by the British government because they weren't considered strategically important. Now, they didn't, they didn't let on this to the Nazis. Um, so they demilitarized the Channel Islands. Some had already um, enlisted in the British Army, so they'd already gone. There was no conscription, I believe. Um, they evacuated some, I think, to Britain. But then the Channel Islands were just left. And um, then June 1940, um, the Nazis invaded uh, Guernsey and Jersey. And life just changed for those who were left behind. Not massively overnight as such, um, but it got progressively worse. So you've got curfews, new laws, lost jobs, radios confiscated. They all had to carry ID cards. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen the film or read the book, um, The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. I actually really love that, that, that film. don't know how historically accurate it is, but if you want a good idea of what it was like in the Channel Islands under Nazi occupation, that will give you a decent enough, um, a decent enough experience of that, so to speak. Um, one, one particular thing, actually, what I remember that the film touches upon is the, the use of in, local informants by the Nazis. So they sort of, I don't know whether it was through bribery or through intimidation, but they got locals to inform on other locals who were doing wrong things. And um, yeah, that wasn't good. So by... 1944, fast forward four years, um, the situation was actually quite dire and you've got many occupants of Guernsey and Jersey who were nearly starving. So let's just shift our focus for a second from Harold to his sister, his older sister, Louisa. Now, she lost one of her sons, or was it her only son? It was one of the other, in combat. Um, and shortly after this, I think. We're talking sort of late 42, 43 at this point. Um, she um, she took in an escaped Soviet slave uh, because Jersey, they uh, the Nazis brought in Soviet prisoners um, to Jersey and they were forced to work as basically slaves. Um, and one of them escaped and Louisa came across this uh, this prisoner and she didn't turn him in. She took him in. Um, she had lost her own son, as I've already said. And I think there was something she said about, I have to look after another mother's son because she'd lost her own. So she sheltered this guy for 
18 months, she fed him, she clothed him, she tried to um, teach him more English, work on his accent with him. And unfortunately, I've already mentioned these informants who would sort of tattle on the other locals. Somebody ratted her out. And it meant that Harold, Louisa, and their other sister, Ivy Forster, they were all arrested, tried, and found guilty. Oh, I didn't forgot to show you more census records. Or did I? Oh, that was Louisa's one. Um, these are identity cards, by the way, and um, uh, an example of a newspaper report from the time. Um, I got so distracted by the story and forgot forgetting to show you the slides. Um, so yes, this is the record of Harold's prosecution. Uh, he received uh, a sentence of five months imprisonment. Uh, Louisa got two years because she was the one who'd actually um, taken in the um, uh, Soviet prisoner. And Ivy got five years and, excuse me, five months and 15 days. Um, they'd also had a wireless as well. You're supposed to get uh, surrender your radios. Um, they, uh, Louisa hadn't done that. So you've got three members of this family who are now, in effect, political prisoners. Um, so over the next 10 months, Harold was transported from various prisons in France um, and then he ended up at two concentration camps, one after the other in Germany. And then on the 5th of April 1945, he was taken to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. And if it sounds familiar, it's because we've, one, we've mentioned it today already, uh, but two, it's where Anne Frank died only months before. And when he arrived there, this is something that Harold recalled later. When he arrived at Bergen-Belsen, the camp commandant addressed everybody. And this is what he was told. That I was entering a new world. There would be no contact with the world outside. I was to forget about my wife and my child. <sighs> this is really hard to read. But I would never see them again for many of my comrades and for untold thousands who would have passed through the gates before those words were true. I didn't cry when I practiced this, I promise. Um, I can't imagine what Harold experienced during these very dark 10 months and these particularly dark 10 days at Bergen-Belsen. Um, and I can't imagine either what millions of others would have suffered. Um, so the Jewish people, disabled people, gay people, the Sinta, the Roma, anybody that the Nazis considered to be um, subhuman. It's pretty horrific. But we don't actually have to imagine. Uh, we, can rem we, we can read about it uh, because of people like Harold. So 11 days after arriving, or was it 10? 10 or 11 days after arriving at Bergen-Belsen, um, it was liberated. Um, Harold was rescued. Um, according to a newspaper report that I found, he weighed six stone, 10 pounds. Um, and he, as many others of the people who um, survived, uh, required care and recovery. And he reportedly struggled to walk. He had to use a stick for about a year afterwards, I think, to walk with. And reportedly, he was the only British survivor of Bergen-Belsen. And I'm afraid that Louisa did not survive. She fell ill at the Ravensbrück concentration camp and was murdered in the gas chambers in February 1945. Ivy was not deported on health grounds. She, from the information I found, a doctor lied and said she had tuberculosis. So she actually served her sentence in Jersey. So she survived. And on the 17th of September 1945, the war was over and Joseph Kramer, the commandant of Bergen-Belsen and several others, they were put on trial for their crimes at Lundberg in Germany. 
This was one of the first trials of its kind. And it was also one of the first times that the rest of the world heard from eyewitnesses the true horrors of these concentration camps. And um, despite, I'm going I'm to cry again, despite still undergoing his recovery, uh, so he, the, the camp was liberated in April. This is September, the same year. Harold went back to Germany to give evidence at this trial, and he was the first civilian witness to speak. Don't cry, don't cry. Um, his testimony is a really chilling read. Um, you can read, I think, all of it online, but you can also read snippets of it in our newspaper collection. This is a very small sample from the Daily Herald that, you know, this trial was widely reported in the newspapers um, because it was that shocking. Like, a lot of this wasn't known beforehand. Um, so I won't read all of this. I'll just read the second part. But it says, I don't think it's humanly possible to describe it, but it was vile. The smell was abominable. A night in these huts was something that a man like Dante could describe, but I can't. As in Dante's Inferno. Hell, basically. So that was the trial. Um, and because of testimony like his, the world found out about these atrocities. But his story wasn't over, um, actually. Only a few months later, Harold was asked by the BBC to record an interview. Now, this was a particularly special interview. Um, he was asked to speak, to introduce the King's speech on Christmas Day in December 1945. Um, and this is, this is just a, a little example. This is a, a photograph of him um, uh, holding his uh, BBC microphone and everything. Um, and actually, the... The photograph I showed you at the beginning, um, that was taken on this very day, just after he gave his interview. And looking at him, you, you, would, you wouldn't think he went from camp to camp um, for 10 months. You, you wouldn't think that. Um, but yeah, that's Harold. Um, once he was recovered, he went back to teaching. Um, he went back to his wife and child and he died in 1985, aged, I think he was 73, I think. And I came across another newspaper report um, around the time that he died, I think. And I really wish I'd included this now. But it was basically, you know, the, the people in Jersey who were remembering him and what he was like. And... People said that he despised unfairness um, and was very caring, um, liked people to be strong. Um, yeah. I. Yes, that's Howard's story. Um, if anybody's actually interested, um, this has been made into a film, which I only realised after I'd finished this research. Um, so it's called Another Mother's Son, and it focuses more on Louisa's story and her taking in the um, Soviet prisoner. But um, what, what I've lost my train of thought. Um, but Harold and Ivy are also included um, in the story as well. It's got a really good cast, and I've not watched it yet, but I plan to. If anybody's seen it. Please tell me your thoughts equally if you're looking for something to watch this weekend. Um, and I think I think it might be worth it. And I think I'll be watching it as well. I have written a blog post about this, which covers much of what I've spoken about today. Um, Jesse, if you could put that in the comments, just in case anybody's interested. Um, it's got links to all of the, the records that I've looked at today. If you want to go and look at them and the newspaper report and the photographs and things like that. Um, this is just one person's story. Um, if you're still here listening, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <sighs> because if we all listen and we all learn from horrible things like this, why am I crying? Um, this won't happen again. And we can make the world a better place by being accepting and caring and tolerant. Oh, I'm a very emotional person. 
I apologise for crying live on Fancast from Home. But hey ho, I hope that that was of interest to you guys. And yeah, if you are still listening and you're still watching, um, thank you. This is a really good question, um, Jill. Question from Jill. Um, so he was known as Bill, and um, he actually made it home, I believe. And um, yeah, he he survived, which was great. Um, okay. Um, let's have a look. Uh, Karen says, my cousin's great uncle, Willibrand Franz Hode Zelga. He was born in London. He was gassed on 28th of April 1945 um, at Mulhausen concentration camp in Austria. He was of Italian descent, accused of being a communist. Well, we're remembering him today as well, aren't we? And, okay. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate we've just ticked over um five o'clock ticked over the hour um thank you for tuning in today and what's something a little, a little bit different today um go and have a look at the the new records and the new newspapers that we've added this week as always continue to share your wonderful stories whether they are cheery and inspiring or not so cheery but still inspiring okay um and next week, Rose is going to be your host, and I'm sure she'll have a whole host of newspaper content on for you. And just as an aside, would anybody be interested if I managed to bat my eyelashes at some of the Boston Spa team and get them on here? Would anybody be interested in that? I'll just wait and see what you guys say. Um, have a lovely weekend, look after yourselves, and we will see you next week. Take care.